Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for joining. So we have a lot to discuss because we have Rosh Hashanah is coming up next a week from tonight, I guess. And I don't think we'll be able to meet next Friday. So we still have a lot, a lot to talk about. So just to lay out the roadmap of what we're going to try to cover today, we want to continue talking about the concept of Rosh Hashanah, the Kabbalistic interpretation of Rosh Hashanah, which is what we discussed last week. So we want to finish, not finish, we want to continue on that theme. But we also have some business that is unique and specific to this year, because this year is a unique year in that on Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, because Rosh Hashanah falls out on the first, <clears throat> sorry, the first day of Rosh Hashanah, falls out on Shabbat, so we don't blow the shofar on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. Now, if you think about it, this is a big deal because Rosh Hashanah is a very important holiday. The main mitzvah of the day, the main feature of the day is the sounding of the shofar. And here we're missing a critical ingredient from Rosh Hashanah in this year. Now, I know we blow the shofar the second day. That's a beautiful thing. That, but that's not, that's not a biblical mitzvah, that's rabbinic. And we'll discuss some of that as well. But it begs the question, how, how, do you, how do you do Rosh Hashanah without blowing the shofar? So that is a theme that's in addition to the concept of Rosh Hashanah in general, it's also unique to this year. So we'll have to give at least a few minutes to that, um, to that discussion. Okay, so we're gonna go first, we're gonna discuss the concept of Rosh Hashanah in general and deal with a few concepts of Rosh Hashanah according to the, from the perspective of the Kabbalah, and then we'll get to the specific year. So I don't want to repeat what I said last week, um, everything I said last week, because you already know that, but just maybe in a sentence or two, a minute, 60 seconds, you'd be kind enough to give me 60 seconds. And we discussed that the essential idea of Rosh Hashanah from the perspective of the Kabbalah is what the Kabbalah calls, you have to build the attribute of kingship, Another way of, talk, of saying it is you want to awaken within God the desire and pleasure to recreate the world. In other words, you want to recreate, you want to draw down the pleasure in having a relationship with the world. And as we discussed, is that God is transcendent. The entire universe is insignificant for God. And God chooses to create the world because he wants a relationship with the creation. But that is something that is not natural. It's something that uh, cannot be taken for granted because God is transcends. So wh why would he be invested in this project called the universe or having, having an emotional connection or, or deep bond with the universe or specifically with this earth and more specifically with humanity and more specifically with myself? So the answer is that there's something within God wants the relationship. So God has a certain pleasure. However, this pleasure is something that we have to recreate every year. And because we have to recreate it every year, that's what Rosh Hashanah is all about. And we discussed last week at some length is that the way we recreate the feeling and, and desire of Hashem, of God, to create the world is one of the ways of doing that is we have to show him that we are devoted and we are dedicated and we are focused on the relationship because if we're not interested why would he be interested right we, I, we had the metaphor we mentioned the metaphor last week of a child parent playing with a child now the parent really doesn't care about the game because the game is way below the parent's level of intelligence the only reason why the parent is um limiting himself or herself to play with the blocks, to play in the sandbox, to play with the game with the child is because the parent wants a relationship with the child. And for that, the parent decides to um, separate from his or her own business or own ideas or own level of in in intelligence and lower him or herself to connect to something very specific and, ve and very physical. Now, after a while, the parent says, do I really want this? And the answer, the only person who could make the parent want this is if the child wants it. But if the parent is playing in the, in, the, in the sandbox and the child is elsewhere, the child says, you know what, I'm tired of, of, of the game, I'll go play on the slide. And the parent says, I don't want to be in the sandbox. And the only purpose of being in the sandbox 
is to connect to you. And that's the metaphor here where the, God has to see, God waits for us to call out to him and say, yes, this relationship is important to us. And when we do so, that awakens within him, within God, the desire to recreate the world. And when God wants to recreate the world, as we discussed last week, it's not just the recreation of the same energy, it's a much deeper energy than we had in the past. And we discussed that in the eve before Rosh Hashanah, the evening before Rosh Hashanah, all the energy ascends and returns back to God. And God says, maybe I don't want this. And then we have to awaken within God the will to, re to desire the relationship with, God, with the world. And Kabbalah explains, and we'll touch upon it today somewhat, that will is the deepest part of the person. And therefore, when you draw down God's desire, draw God's will, you're actually drawing down from God's essence. And because God's essence is infinite, then every year you have a deeper um, energy available to you and to the world that would, did not exist in the past. So it's not just we're recreating what happened in the past, but we are actually drawing down a new potential. And we also mentioned last week that the big difference between Passover and Rosh Hashanah which is six months apart, is that Passover, God takes the first step. The Jewish people were just passive. They weren't necessarily worthy of redemption. And God um, comes to rescue the Jewish people. And that is a healthy dynamic in a relationship where one party takes uh, initiative. But six months later, now it's time for the other party in the relationship to take initiative. And therefore God says, I don't know if I want this relationship. What I need to see is that you want it. And that's what the shofar is about, because the shofar is literally, quite literally, we're taking up the horn and we're calling to God. It's like picking up the phone and calling God and saying, yes, we, we're, we're in this relationship, we want this. Um, we can elaborate upon what does that mean that we tell God we want it. It's much more than just saying, yeah, I want a relationship with you. It's almost like aligning our will with God's will. But um, we'll get to that hopefully, hopefully uh, sometime today. Okay, so that's, in, I guess, in short, what we said last week. I may have missed a few points, so um, feel free to fill me in. But now we want to elaborate on this just, just a little bit, um, discuss maybe different angles, and then we want to talk about specifically this year. Okay, fine. So the first question we want to address is, why is, why is the um, Rosh Hashanah on the date that it is on? In other words, um, every Jewish holiday is on, most Jewish holidays are on the anniversary of an, uh, an event. And according to Judaism, I like to say, we don't, sell, we don't believe in anniversaries. Anniversary means that today we're commemorating something that happened in the past. Now, it happened years ago, but today we'll remember the past. According to the Kabbalah, there's no such thing as an anniversary, because why would you stop today to commemorate the past? I mean, that's living in the past. According to the Kabbalah, every year at the anniversary of a specific event, that energy that was available on that event is recreated. In other words, if on Passover 3,300 years ago, God gave us the gift of freedom, so every year on, Pas on Passover, on Pesach, we're not just commemorating and telling the story that our ancestors achieved freedom in the past. What we are telling ourselves and what we are experiencing is that on Pesach, we have the ability to internalize the feeling of freedom. And therefore, we're actually not celebrating something that's in the past. We're actually celebrating something that's very much in the present. And the same thing is for the giving of the Torah. And the same thing is for Yom Kippur. What, is, what do we celebrate on Yom Kippur? On Yom Kippur, we celebrate the Day of Atonement. Why is it the Day of Atonement? Because the first year when the Jewish people left Egypt, um, you know the story in the book of Exodus, they sin, they serve the golden calf. After they sin, they achieve forgiveness. And the ultimate and complete forgiveness is when God gives them the second tablets after Moshe shattered the first tablets, right? You know the story. Moshe descended from the mountain. He saw the um, Egel, the golden calf, and he shattered the tablets. And then Moshe go, climbs the mountain again, and he asks for forgiveness. And ultimately, God gives him a second set of tablets to give to the Jewish people, which represents 
that the, that the forgiveness and the atonement and the relationship has been restored and fulfilled. So when was the day that we got the second tablets? It was Yom Kippur. So Yom Kippur was the first time that we had complete and full forgiveness. Now, um, therefore, every year on Yom Kippur, we could tap into that energy of forgiveness. So we're not commemorating what happened in the past. We're li reliving that experience. Um, there's a beautiful teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, founder of the Hasidic movement. And we're mentioning him because, first of all, he's the founder of the Hasidic movement, so he should, we should mention him. Why not? We're also mentioning him because a few days ago, on the 18th of Elul, I believe it was Monday, was the anniversary, anniversary of his birthday. So this week is still influenced by the birthday of the, of the Baal Shem Tov. So the Baal Shem Tov had a very interesting teaching. Here is the Mishnah. The Jewish law states as follows. If you read the Megillah, the Megillah is a scroll of Esther. On Purim, we read the scroll of Esther. So the Baal Shem Tov says that the, that the Mishnah says, if you read the Megillah of Esther backward, you did not fulfill your obligation. What does backward mean? The Mafreya? It means you start at chapter 10, then go to chapter 9, then go to chapter 8. You did not fulfill your obligation. Why would you do that? Well, I know a lot of people that do that. They open up a book of 500 pages. How do you decide if you're going to read the book? Never read the first page. There's always a good hook, and you never know what's going to happen. You want to know if you read the book. You open the book in the middle. You start reading. If you see there's some potential, you go back to the beginning. So a lot of people do that. So I guess that's what the Mishnah was talking about. You, get, you open up chapter 6. You see, I want to see what the action is. Let me see the drama. If I like it, I'll stick around, and I'll go back to the beginning. So the Mishnah says, if you read the Megillah backward, even though you got the whole story, but you read it backward, you did not fulfill your obligation. Okay, beautiful Mishnah. Now you know what to do on your for it. Uh, so the Baal Shento says, the meaning, the Hebrew word, the mafreya, backward, doesn't only mean backward. In the Hebrew, the word the mafreya means, it means you're reading it in the past. In other words, you are reading the Megillah as if it's a story that happened in the past. So that's the deeper Kabbalistic interpretation of this Mishnah. Even if I read the Megillah from chapter 1 to chapter 10 in order, says the Baal Shem Tov, I have not, I have not fulfilled my obligation if I think that the drama of the Megillah has ha happened in the past and does not happen now. Every year on Purim, that same drama, that same energy, that same commitment to God and to the Torah um, is, should be re-experienced. And if I'm not re-experiencing it, then I miss the point. And the same as a Passover, and the same for Israel every holiday. Why am I saying this? Same as for Rosh Hashanah. But what's Rosh Hashanah? So we say in the liturgy, in the liturgy we say, this is the day, this is the day of the beginning of your creation. We celebrate the anniversary of the creation of the world. And what does that mean? It means, as we said, in the beginning of time, God decides to create the universe. After a while, God says, I don't know if I really need this. I don't know if I really want this. And then the human being comes about and says, God, I want this relationship. And that creates within God the desire to, to continue this relationship and intensify this relationship. Okay, the problem here is a technical problem, but technical problems always represent something deeper. What's the technical problem? The technical problem is that we don't celebrate Rosh Hashanah on the anniversary of the creation of the world. In reality, we celebrate Rosh Hashanah on the anniversary of the creation of the human being. You follow the biblical story. Adam was created on the sixth day of creation. And the sixth day of creation is the, tw is, is the first of Elul, uh, and first of Tishrei. So Rosh Hashanah is really not the, begin not the creation of man. As, I'm sorry, Rosh Hashanah is not the anniversary of the creation of the universe. It's the anniversary of the creation of man. Why is that? Why are we celebrating? The if we're celebrating the creation of every aspect of the universe, why do we do so on the anniversary of man? So this aligns with the Kabbalistic principle, and, 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 and uh, it's also, we follow the liturgy, the liturgy, the, the sentence that we say in the prayers over and over again on Rosh Hashanah reads as follows. We say, this is the beginning of your actions. Today, this, Zehayom, this day is the beginning of your actions. It's a commemoration for the first day. This is the day of the beginning of your actions. It's a commemoration for the first day. Now that's a little bit of a contradiction because the first clause we say, this is the day of the beginning of your actions, which means today on Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of your action. 
But then we say it's only a commemoration to the first day, which means it's not the first day. So which one is it? Is it the first day or is it not? Is it the beginning or is it not the beginning? Is it the beginning or is it not the first day? So this is what, here's where the Kabbalah comes in. Hasidic philosophy elaborates and says, in some ways it's the beginning, in some ways it's not. It's only a commemoration of the first day because it's not the first day of creation. It's the sixth day of creation. It's the sixth day of creation. Nevertheless, we consider it the day of the anniversary of creation because now, whether or not God wants to continue to create the, un the rest of the universe, that's dependent on the human being. So the reason why we celebrate the anniversary of the creation or the recreation, not on the first day of the six days of creation, but on the sixth day is because now it's dependent on the human being. In the beginning of time, the desire to create comes from God himself. But once that desire has been actualized, now the desire to create has to come from the human being. So in other words, Rosh Hashanah is not necessarily a day where we sit down and we're passive and we're in judgment. We just have to, we just have to hope that uh, we did enough good deeds. We have enough good deeds in the bank accounts and uh, everything will be fine. Rosh Hashanah is a day where we have to really inspire God, right? It's not about God inspiring us that we have on Passover. It's inspire God to want the relationship with the world and with humanity. How do we inspire God? When we inspire ourselves to desire our, the relationship with God prioritize the relationship with God, to align our will with the will of God, to align our pleasure with the pleasure of God, as we will discuss. Okay, that is, um, that is one point, one introduction. Another introduction is that, on the same point, and the same point of why do we celebrate the, 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 the birthday of the universe on the day that the human being was created. And one answer, one Kabbalistic answer is as follows. When was the universe complete? Um, universe is not complete until the human being comes about. Why is that? So the, when the universe was created pre the human being, the universe was created in six days, but there's, everybody understands there's tremendous multiplicity in the, in, in the, in the universe. You look around, and you see various different forces coming together, sometimes opposing forces, and you don't necessarily see um, the oneness. You don't necessarily see, necessarily see the uniformity. In other words, the more you investigate into the essence of creation, the more you can see certain patterns, and the more you can see um, a certain scientific truths that pervade the entire universe. But if you just look around, in creation, what you're basically seeing is multiplicity. You're saying so many forms of life, so many forms of vegetation, so many forms of mineral life, of minerals, there's just multiplicity. And if you talk about the vastness of the universe, that's certainly so. Now, what happens when the human being comes about? The human being comes about and realizes that in some sense, in the scientific sense, that took a few thousand years for people to realize this, but in the spiritual sense, the human being realizes that there's a oneness that pervades the universe. In other words, once the human being realizes that all this multiplicity was created by God, that's the human perspective, the human recognition, the human mind is the only creation that can recognize its creator. And when the human mind recognizes its the creator, what happens is, is that the human being sees the unity throughout the entire universe. Because even though there's tremendous amount of multiplicity, and a tremendous amount of diversity. But if they were all created by the, set, by the one God, then they must be created for the same purpose. In other words, there's an overarching purpose that includes all of this multiplicity. So in other words, what God, what the human being recognizes is that we're not talking about a place of multiplicity, we're talking about a place of oneness. There's a oneness, there's a purpose that pervades the entire universe. So the world is not complete until you, the human being is placed on the earth and realizes and recognizes the purpose and now sees the world as a unit, as, a one, as one story. And in other words, to be able to thread all the aspects of the universe into one whole story, that's the function of the human being. And the universe is not complete until the human being does exactly that. And that's why, when is the world created? Not when God created the world, because when God created the world, the world is not yet complete. 
the, human, the world is the anniversary of creation is when the human being is the one who sort of creates the world, recognizes that there's a oneness in the world, sees it as a whole, sees it as a, one, as, as a, a story that has a purpose to his the story. Then he threads all the multiplicity within the universe together, and that's how he completes the world by bringing peace to the world, by realizing that it's not opposing forces, it's an overarching story. And that's why, that's just talk about the day that, Rosh, that was chosen for Rosh Hashanah, because when was the world created? When man was created. Why? Because the world is not complete until man's perspective is introduced. What's man's perspective? That the world is not just a, a place of multiplicity, but all that multiplicity is really um, connected because beneath the surface is one story. Now, the same is true, everything that's true. In the macro is also true in the micro. The sages say, the Medra says, Olam katan zeha adam. Every human being is a small universe. And in some sense, we also experience this question of multiplicity versus the oneness. And if you look at our life, especially if you live in the, happen to live in the modern world, uh, our life is characterized by fragmentation. There's all kinds of different things at any given moment. There are many hats you have to wear. There are many responsibilities you have, and they, they're divergent responsibilities. You may be a parent, you may be a child, you may be an employee, you may be an employer, you may be somebody who's concerned with their physical well-being, you may be someone concerned with your spiritual well-being, you may have to help others, you may have to take care of self, uh, the list goes on and on. And within yourself, even taking care of yourself, you have multiple needs and multiple perspectives, and that's why the state of human being, the state, the state of humanity is, is uh, almost like chaos because we're being pulled in all different directions. And this creates a terrible fragmentation that robs us of peace of mind. And that's the state of the universe before the human being is introduced. The job of the human being, again, just like as a human being, what we do for the rest of the universe, we're also doing within ourselves. The job of the human being is to realize that all the diversity within myself, the fact that I have all these responsibilities and all these needs, and I have to pay the electric bill, and I have to make sure I eat breakfast, and I have to make sure I sleep eight hours, a list of things I have to do before I can even decide, before I can even hope to do anything I really want to do, right? All the things I need to do before the things I want to do. So there's so much multiplicity, and I'm being pulled in all different directions. And the only way I can really complete my creation and bring peace to my creation is if I'm able to see that all the aspects of my life are connected with a unity. What's the unity? The unity is that they all serve a higher purpose. Why am I eating lunch? Why am I paying the electric bill? Why am I going to the gym? Why am I taking, taking care of my health? It's not separate from my purpose in the creation. Everything that I have in my life is part of the story of my purpose. Who are the people I have to interact with? Who are the people I can influence? And everything, all the diversity in my life is part of a story. So when I have to uh, sit in traffic to uh, get from point A to point B, I'd rather not. But I'm sitting in the, in the car and my child is with me. This is part of my purpose. I have this time. Don't get frustrated. Speak to your child. Um, take the time to communicate. That's just an example. But everything you do, there is no such thing as a fragment, a fr a fragment of my life. Every fragment is here for a reason and it contributes to the overarching purpose, to the overarching story. And that's the job of the human being, to understand that there's a oneness in our life, and the oneness is very much connected to the purpose. So again, this addresses the question of why Rosh Hashanah is the day of the creation of man, if Rosh Hashanah is the day, in essence, if, if in reality, Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of the creation of the universe. The answer is because the unit, I'm sorry, why are we celebrating the creation of the world or the universe on the anniversary of creation of man? Seems like man is separate than the creation of the universe. The creation of the universe happens before the creation of man. And the answer is that the universe is not complete until the human perspective is introduced. In what, what, what aspect of the human perspective do we mean? The idea that the human being has the correct perspective or is capable of reaching the correct perspective. It doesn't happen naturally. But even through the sciences, we realize that there's a oneness that pervades. 
And certainly from a spiritual perspective, we realize that there's a purpose to all of this. And in that sense, we are almost threading the entire world into one organism. It's all part of one purpose. It all has one overarching idea, and that is to express the goodness and kindness and truth of God. And the same, of course, is in our life. So these are some introductions about continuing the theme of last week. And if anybody wants to make any comments, please go ahead. Otherwise, we'll devote the last few minutes, the last 15 or so minutes, 18 minutes, to the idea of Rosh Hashanah that falls out on Shabbos. But before that, I forgot, I forgot I have one more point to make. Um, so we'll take any questions if anybody has. Otherwise, we'll make one more point. And then we go to the idea of this unique year, the unique year of uh, when Rosh Hashanah um, begins on Shabbat. When you say the purpose of the human, um, are you talking about our, our individual pers- purpose or of humanity in general, or both? Well, I think that, I think that it, it's both, the answer is both, in the, ma- in the macro and the micro. In other words, our purpose as a collective race, collective humanity in the world is to bring the oneness to the world. Our own individual purpose is to bring the oneness to our universe, our chaotic universe. There's a medrash that says as follows. There's a medrash that says, one of the psalms that we say on Friday night, on Friday night we say six psalms, and each one is supposed to be, uh, each one represents one day of the week. And after the six psalms, we say l'chadodi, which is welcoming the Shabbat, which represents the seventh day of the week. Let me just make sure I'm counting right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Correct. Yes. So amongst these psalms, there is an interesting verse. What does the verse state? I have to find it. Um, I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's the first psalm. So it's psalm number 90, 95. And I don't have the English translation here, but I'll try to translate myself. Um, the verse says like this, Come, let us bow and let us kneel and let us bless before Hashem, our maker. That's what the verse says in Psalms 30, 30, uh, 95. So the Medrash says that who said this psalm, of course, who said this psalm? So as the Medrash, just this psalm was said um, um, by Adam, when Adam was created. And the Medrash has this idea that every creation has a song. And every creation has its own way of praising God. Of course, we don't always see the tree praising God. And I'm not sure the tree has intelligence to create. To, I, I suppose the tree does not have intelligence to create God. But the tree has a soul. And the soul of the tree praises God. And there are all kinds of madrashim that talk about the soul and the energy of the animals and of the various creations. And how each one, each creation has a unique song, unique poetry, and how it expresses the glory of God. Of course, you have to know how to listen. But it's there. In other words, um, you have to, the soul of every creation feels the connection to God and, of course, praises God. What is the praise of the human being? So, King, so the verse says that when Adam was created, the first thing he did, he said, come, let us bow to God, our maker. Wonderful verse, very inspiring. The question, of course, is who was he talking to and why is he talking in the, in the plural? Come, let us let us bow. Who's the us? Who's the us? It's just Adam. So the Medrash says, Adam says this to all the animals. Adam says this to all the creatures. Adam tells everybody, come let us bow to the God, to, the maker, to our maker. What does that mean? Adam, he went to the zoo, he went to the Bronx Zoo, and he got the lion and the elephant and the giraffe to join him a minion and say Kaddish. Is that what he did? You know, what does it mean? He goes to the animals and says, come, let us bow. So one interpretation is that what Adam does, Adam realizes that it's not enough that he, only he is the one who, who blesses God, but, but Adam realizes that all of creation, in effect, is blessing God. All of creation is a testament to, to Hashem's um, brilliance and Hashem's power to create. So when he tells the animals, come, let us, what is he telling them? What is he telling himself? He's telling himself 
that you sh I should see myself as part of the universe, where all the diversity of the universe is really here just for one purpose, to praise God. And again, praise God is, is, is a metaphor for to connect to the unity of God. And the reason why he tells that to the horse and to the elephant and the gi giraffe, I don't know that he had a conversation with the giraffe, but what it means is he sees himself as part of a whole with the rest of nature, and he sees that he, together with the rest of nature, is able to praise God. But he has to tell them to do so, which means the perspective, that the, the perspective and the awareness, the awareness that we're all part of one, that Adam has, and that Adam could bestow upon the animals. The animals don't have that. Each animal feels that he's a hero by himself, survival of the fittest. But the ability of the human being, but the point is here, the human being is, is including, not enough to realize God created me. It's God created us. We're all part of a whole, the entire universe. So again, I do that. The, the humanity as a whole, represented by Adam, does this to the rest of the universe. But within myself, the human part of myself has to see and has to realize and has to thread together both the animalistic part of myself the part of myself that is self-centered, the part of myself that seeks physical well-being, and say, it's not a conflict. It's not that part of me wants to study Torah, and part of me wants um, to uh, enjoy physical pleasures. It's all part of a whole, because the physical could serve the spiritual, and the spiritual could give meaning to the physical. And therefore, it's not a conflict. It could become a, whole, a, a wholesome oneness. But who can do that? That's the human awareness, the animalistic side of self will not recognize it on its own. It's the human perspective within ourselves that is capable of realizing that and bestowing that awareness to the rest of self. So I hope that uh, makes, uh, clarifies a little bit, Elisa. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna go, I, wasn't, I had one more point to say, but I'm not gonna say it because it's never gonna get anywhere. We have to, we have to, we have to worry about what are we going to do on Rosh Hashanah? It falls out on Shabbos. Okay, so um, let's just start with technical law. Technically, technically, you're, the, the sounding of the shofar on Shabbos is not a biblical violation. For whatever reason, without getting into technical law, technically you're allowed to, you're allowed to blow the shofar on Shabbos. And therefore, biblically speaking, you're supposed to blow the shofar on Shabbos. Um, at a certain point in history, the rabbis said, we're not blowing the shofar if it falls out on Shabbos. Why not? Because that can lead to a violation. Even though that itself is not a violation, it could lead to a violation. Why could it lead to a violation? Because it's possible that some, not everybody knows how to blow the shofar. So it's possible that somebody would take a shofar and go to somebody else to figure out how to blow. And by doing so, they're going to carry the shofar from a private domain from their own home through the public domain and that's a, one of the that's the one one of the prohibited labors on shabbat right on yom Tif, on the holiday you may carry on shabbat you're not supposed to carry and therefore the rabbi said even though it's not certainty you could blow the shofar without violating shabbat but it's possible it's possible that some people are not going to know how to blow so they are going to go and blow the shofar and they're going, to, they're going to carry the shofar on Shabbat to figure out how to blow. So therefore, we're canceling. There's no shofar on Shabbat. That's what, that's what the Mishnah explains. And again, the reasoning was articulated in the Talmud. It's called, it's called Gzeira the Rabba, the decree of Rabba. Rabba is a Talmudic sage. Not that Rabba instituted this, 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 this decree. This decree goes back uh, way before Rabba. But Rabba articulates the reason. Okay, all good and fine. But the Kabbalists have a problem. They say it makes no sense. How could it be that you're depriving all of the Jewish people of the great flow of energy and the great flow of potential that comes down on Rosh Hashanah for the rest of the year because maybe it's possible that one person is going to uh, violate the Shabbat. How could it be that the rest of the Jewish people are going to be, are going to be deprived of what the shofar accomplishes. And in other words, we have to explain, it, to, to explain the questions in other words. Everything we said last week and this week about the unbelievable power of the shofar, which is what? Which is that without the shofar, God is not sure he wants the relationship with the world. And the shofar represents that we turn to God and we say, God, we really want a relationship with you. And therefore, um, we're aligning our will and our pleasure with you. 
and everything. And, and what do we really want? We really want things that are transcendent. We really want to connect to God. That's what we really want. That's our purpose. And when we align our purpose and our will with God, represented by the shofar, because the shofar is a call out to God. And like I said last week, when you're in a relationship, the most important thing you need to know is not how beautiful the other person is, how wealthy the other person is, how intelligent the other person is. You don't even have to know about the sense of humor. What you have to know is, do they want to be in this relationship? And if you suspect that they don't want to be in the relationship, then no matter what they're giving you, it's not meaningful. So when we sound the shofar and we say we're calling to God from the depths of our soul, represented by the shofar, that is what elicits within God the desire to recreate the world. And that's what gives the flow of energy for the upcoming year. So if all this is true, how could, what, what happens on a year when there's no shofar? Okay, well, you say, well, we have the second day. Okay, but the second day is the second day. It's not the first day. In fact, the second day is just rabbinic. So we have to focus on the first day for a moment. And this is a very powerful, uh, so, so, what are, so what are the Kabbalists explain? The Kabbalists explain, there's, there's a lot of literature on this, but the Kabbalists explain something interesting. And it's interesting not just because it will help us for this, for this specific year, but it gives us broader insight into other things as well. The Kabbalists explain. First, I'm just going to put it out, and then I'm going to try to explain it. So first, I'm just going to say it the way the Kabbalists say it, and then I'm going to say, try to explain. What do the Kabbalists say? The Kabbalists say very simple. Whatever the shofar accomplishes on a regular year on Rosh Hashanah, have no fear. We get that as well on, the, on this year, when the first day of Rosh Hashanah falls down on Shabbat. We'll have the same flow. Don't worry about it. How are we going to have the same flow? Because whatever Rosh Hashanah, whatever the shofar accomplishes on a typical year, this year will be accomplished through just, not by blowing the shofar, by the power of Shabbat. So the Shabbat could achieve what the shofar could achieve. Now, this is enough to make us happy because now we don't, we don't have to worry. It's going to be a wonderful year. We're going to have new potential. You'll be able to make breakthroughs in every area of your life. You'll be able to surpass your past year. But spiritually, physically, you'll be able to lift up more weights. You'll be able to be more kind. You'll be able, everything you need to do, you'll be able to surpass the previous year because it's a new flow coming from God on Rosh Hashanah. Even though there's no shofar, this year it's going to be done by the power of Shabbat. So if you were concerned of what's going to happen this year, you rest assured it's no problem. Everything is fine you'll have that new potential, okay? But if you have a few more minutes, we have to figure out what does this mean? What is this hocus pocus? Shofar won't do it, so Shabbat will do it. What is this, a game? Um, what, how, how, what, what does this mean? In other words, what I'm really trying to ask is to answer, to understand, to really to understand um, what's happening here is you have to, we have to try to figure out what is, what is Shabbat? And if you get to the core of Shabbat, if you figure out what Shabbat is, now you'll understand why Shabbat could fill in for the shofar. So like I told you, it's not just going to tell you about Rosh Hashanah. It's not just telling you about this year, but it's actually telling you what is the nature of Shabbat, not just the Shabbat of Rosh Hashanah, but every Shabbat the entire year, including the one that's going to start in a few hours. So this was a good class. It's a good investment of time because you learned about this year. Uh, you learned about what happens this year, but, but if you stick around for another few minutes, um, you'll also know what... You'll have four minutes. In four minutes, you'll be able to figure out what Shabbat is. Okay. So let's, let's, let's try to figure this out. Try to do this quickly because you have to get ready for Shabbat. So what did we say? To reiterate once more, we said Rosh Hashanah is the time we have to draw down God's pleasure. We need God to want to be invested in this relationship. So the key Kabbalistic word is Tanu, is pleasure. We can talk about pleasure for a long time because the Kabbalah has a tremendous amount of things to say about pleasure. From the Kabbalistic perspective, the deepest part of your soul is pleasure, more than will, more than anything else. Okay, so we have to draw down from God's pleasure. What is Shabbat? Kabbalistically, Shabbat is pleasure. Now we have to figure out why is Shabbat pleasure? What, what does it mean? But Shabbat is pleasure. That's why everything in the Torah has a body and a soul. The mystical perspective is the soul, and the actual physical uh, ritual or halacha, the law that you're supposed to do, is the body. And they're both important because a 
body without a soul is not a great idea, but even a soul without a body is not a great idea. You want to have a little bit of both. Not a, you want a lot of both. So what's happening here? Here's a law on Shabbat. On Shabbat, you have to eat good food and you have to have pleasure. So you go to the store or make it homemade and you have to have good dishes. You have to have good food. And if you have good food all week, you need an additional dish on Shabbat. And this is a whole, this, there's a commandment. One of the commandments of Shabbat, the Karatala. Isaiah says this, the Karatala Shabbat Oneg. You call and confirm within Shabbat pleasure. Shabbat is a day of pleasure. Now, okay, I have pleasure on Shabbat. Why do I have pleasure on Shabbat? Because I'm eating the challenge. The challenge is so good. That's why I, that's what that's what the pleasure of Shabbat is. No. The fact that I'm supposed to eat pleasurable food on Shabbat and enjoy Shabbat's food and enjoy Shabbat taking a walk on Shabbat and enjoy the physical pleasures of Shabbat is because the mystical, spiritual energy of Shabbat is pleasure. We want that pleasure to express itself in the physical realm as well. So in other words, the law that you have to derive pleasure on Shabbat is an expression of a deeper truth. That Shabbat, the theme of Shabbat is pleasure. Why is the theme of Shabbat pleasure? So let's look back at the creation, the very first Shabbat. What happens at the very first Shabbat? The very first of Shabbat, God creates the world six, six days. And in six days, some days are better than others. But once the world was created, on the sixth day, the sixth day is over, says the verse, Hashem saw everything he created and it was very good. And it was very good. Heaven and earth was complete. But the, another interpretation of the word Vayechulu, Vayechulu comes in the word Kilayon, longing, longing for pleasure. When the world was created, was, when the world finished, um, when the creation was finished, that's when the pleasure begins. And if you want a simple metaphor, if you ever engage in construction, raise your hand. Uh, you don't have to, only if you want to. Um, what happens when you want to have a construction, when you, want, when you want to build? You start out with this beautiful idea. It's, I'm going to be sitting on, on, in my house on the, on the porch, on the deck of my hammock, and I'm going to be able to think philosophy. It's going to be wonderful. And that's the idea, and that's the pleasure. And that motivates everything you're going to do. Then you spend three years. You thought it's going to be one year. I know that's what the contractor said, but it took three years. Right? And then you had three years of chaos. What was the chaos? Every detail of the construction was more aggravation. And why is it aggravation? Because everything takes time and everything you have to make sure the plumber comes in time and the electrician comes in time and they don't contradict each other and each one doesn't undo what the other one did, which is what they always do. And you have all this tension. Now, what happens when the project is complete? When the project is complete, now you could return to the purpose of the construction. Why did I engage in this project? Why did I engage in this project? So Shabbos morning, I could sit in my house on the couch and read the Torah. Oh, now all three years during the, during the work week, during the process of the building, your energy is exerting outward. You're giving, you're investing, you're creating. What is pleasure? Pleasure is you return to yourself. You don't have to exert any more energy. And what are you doing? Because you're in tune with the purpose, the purpose of the concept is what brings you the pleasure. So why do we have good food on Shabbat? Why are we supposed to enjoy good food? Because we want to tune into the divine pleasure. Why is this specifically divine pleasure tied into the seventh day? Because the seventh day is when God sees the purpose of creation. Because during the six days, the idea is to create. The question is, when do we see the purpose of creation? That's on the seventh day. And it's true in our lives as well. The six days of work, you go to work. Either you go to Manhattan or you go to get a job. Whatever the case is, even if you don't, because you don't have to work, you are being productive. You're called upon to be productive in the real world. That's the, that's the primary motivation. Okay, people retire and play golf. It's a wonderful thing. But even in golf, you want to be productive. You want to outdo what you did yesterday. So that's the mode of the six days. The mode of the six days is being productive. What's the mode of Shabbat? Shabbat, you're not supposed to be productive. Shabbat is you have to view as everything you're engaged in is already done. Shabbat is taking pleasure and enjoying everything you created, all the, all the productivity. Why? Because you sense the purpose of all this productivity. What's the purpose? Connecting to God, connecting to family, connecting to the transcendent side of life, connecting to the spiritual side of life. So we don't have that much time to elaborate, but I think the takeaway is clear. 
Shabbat, every Shabbat, we, we tap into the divine, ple uh, the divine pleasure. Every Shabbat, God has pleasure within the universe because he sees the universe as not just a place of productivity, but people want to create. It's not only a, a, an expression of productivity, it's an expression of the purpose of the productivity. And the purpose is what brings us pleasure. So in short, and maybe we'll elaborate, maybe we'll have time during the week, maybe Thursday we'll elaborate. But in short, every Rosh Hashanah, the time of Rosh Hashanah is when we awaken within God the pleasure to want to re recreate the world. And when we can't do it through the shofar, we do it through Shabbat. Because Shabbat itself, the theme of Shabbat itself is the pleasure within the universe. And the way we get the pleasure is by tuning into the purpose of, of creation because the purpose is the vehicle for the pleasure. So I want to wish everybody to have a joyous and most importantly, pleasurable Shabbat. You know, it's interesting that Talmud says, the Medrash says that the main theme of the holiday is joy and the main theme of holidays is joy and the main theme of Shabbat is pleasure. It's important to have pleasure on Shabbat because that reflects the pleasure that God takes in the universe and the pleasure that we take in the universe because on Shabbat, we see the purpose of everything we're working for. And people could be working for decades and they don't tune in to why am I doing this? I'm working very hard. Why am I doing this? Of course, for my family. But when are you connecting to your family in a deep way? And that will connect you to the purpose of all your productivity and all your labor. So Shabbat is a time where we're not, it's counterintuitive because in the West, we want to always be productive. And the way we measure product, um, progress is by productivity. But we rob ourselves of the blessing of pleasure, which ple pleasure means connect to the purpose of everything you're doing. So I wish everybody to have a, a peaceful and pleasurable Shabbat, and hopefully we'll see each other soon in, in, in good health. And if anybody has any comments, please go ahead. Jokes, comments, questions, uh, uh, contradictions, it's all good. Rabbi, I have a question for you. Um, what about yes. what, what about what